everyone. Welcome back. Uh, our last uh, webinar of the week, and then back at it next week again. Again, my name is Ping, and with me I have here Thomas, our sales engineer. Hi, guys. Uh, today we'll talk about uh, the last layer in some way, the, the last layer if we look from the bottom up, uh, the application of protocol layer in a network. As always, if you have questions, please send them in anytime you want. And Natalie in the back end will push them over to Thomas and I. We do have a survey. Love to get your input on that. And as always, this session is recorded. Uh, if you didn't miss any other ones, it is available on our YouTube channel. Or if you want to pass this over to anyone else, uh, point them to our YouTube channel. Our next session is next Tuesday. We'll talk about uh, switches, uh, network equipment. So we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about the difference between an unmanaged and a managed switch. Um, and then we have a few more scheduled for you. So um, we'll dive a little deeper into MAC addresses. Uh, since in networking, understanding MAC addresses is very, very important. We'll spend a little bit more time on that. All right, let's get started. Ready? First, thank you. Um, yeah, so if you've been following us now through the, the series of webinars we've been doing, you probably know that we've kind of made our way up through some of the layers, especially with our uh, TCP IP model that we've been using. So we would have started with our network access. We were kind of, I think, talking about some of the different connections, your SFPs or different wires you can have. And we were talking a bit about our IPv4, our IPv version 4, so um, IP addressing, how that works, some subnetting. We were looking at TCP and UDP, the two different ways of establishing a connection or kind of just sending information in hopes it gets there. And so today we're going to be looking at some of the protocols we'll be using on the application layer. So especially that BACnet um, actually has some uses some uh, UDP or kind of um, it uses UDP, but it uses an acknowledgement on the application layer. So it kind of allows us to show that a little bit between the two of them. So this is what we're going to be looking at more today, um, the applications, the protocols on the application layer. Yeah, and, and just a quick note here, if we go back to the OSI, OSI model, which we're not going to show, it is more complex, complex. The application layer is three layers in the OSI layer. Uh, model it has a session as presentation and as application um, it's not important to understand but as we go through today's presentation you'll see talk about for example tls and http in the osi layer those are, are protocols in different layers in the osi layer but here because we're going to talk about it as an application layer uh, just to simplify things it, it does get a little bit uh, confusing if you have questions please ask the and ask away yeah, perfect. Just stay hand up at any time. We'll uh, stop there. So, um, yeah. So, what is our protocols? What are they, and how do they work exactly? So, we'll just first take one of the examples. Is one of the protocols we have in our application layer is HTTP Hypertext Transfer Protocol. This is just the means of us using of us sending our information to us. Um, how we're going to package it and how we're going to send it across um, to our to our device or to our receiver. Um, we have HTTP, which isn't our secure one. So, this is just you generally over port eighty. This is not used transport layer security, so this is unencrypted. This a lot of this would be uh, more susceptible to being um, being interpreted or being being uh, viewed on or uh, spied on. So there's a protocol for transport layer security, as we say, the transport layer. Um, we're just going to have an added level of encryption. So we add a HTTPS transport uh, hypertext transport protocol secured. So this one using port 443 is actually what we do is we add a key before this, this is sent, have a key that's going to be a, effectively what you're doing or the example we used previously would be to get a blender almost, we're going to have a key, we're going to put the, all, all the stuff, stuff into a blender and you're going to send it across, um, across all our lines or public lines so that we're not afraid of someone getting hold of it or someone accessing it because that is not useful unless they have the pre-established key that we're using. So that could be used, um, used to just um, using keys and that, so it just allows the information to be encrypted and to be more secure. So it's two different ways of sending information. Obviously, you'll see HTTPS is a lot more common, and a lot of sites when you try look up the site using HTTP uh, colon slash slash, it'll, it'll redirect you to the one using the secure, as this is uh, obviously just a lot safer to be having your information and that extra step security. I could note here for those who are using APIs already, most of the APIs from different vendors will use HTTPS. It's, 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 the, it's a port that they're using and they're transferring that information using an HTTPS protocol, uh, so a markup. 
format. Thanks, Wayne. Um, let's just quickly, quickly gloss over. Also, we have a load of different protocols. We're going to be predominantly looking at the application layer um, today, but just to mention, even with protocols, we have all, all sorts of different types. What it is, it's just a way of just establishing how we're going to communicate. So everything at the end of the day does break down to ones and zeros, ons and off, electrical or light signals. So what we want to do is be able to have both devices at either end. We have to have, we're just sending a lot of information in a lot of different ways. We're going to have to establish how we're going to pack it, that, send it, when we're going to look for it, and all these different uh, means of doing things. So then even routing protocols is how we're going to, with our different LANs, our different routers, separating our WAN from our LAN, as we had previously. There's different ways of doing this as well. So we have RIPs, so those routing information protocol, one of the original ones that would have been done by HOPs or the amount of um, routers or so you have to go through to get to your area. Then you have ones that are open short, uh, shortest pass first. So OSPF, that's a bit more about doing what the quality of the lines you're using are. And then you have ones here you can see links. So that'll be linked state, state of the links that you're using. Then hybrid ones like EIGRP, they're kind of Cisco or I think is it a uh, proprietary one? That's theirs. Uh, they use the two together and may, you use that. But I think believe OSPF is kind of one of the more commonly used ones you see. And obviously you've uh, BGP as well. But just different ways of having. Um, having routers and knowing to work with each other and be able to transfer information and be able to discuss routes in different ways. So these are all just different means of having protocols. These will be our protocols of the internet as so, well, and we're going to be looking at more our internal protocols. Yeah, so Thomas here, being a, a, a network engineer, he can talk to us about this all day long. This is not important for all most of us to understand. I don't understand this. We wanted to include this just so that you have an appreciation uh, and, and recognize these terms. We don't need to understand this. Uh, in the large, large, large majority of our systems in building technology, there's really only one router. There may be two routers if there's redundancy, but there's no real path selection. Uh, this is where you go into organizations that are running multiple, multiple routers. They're deciding which is the best path to take, and then to build some redundancy and some uh, and some uh, load balancing. Uh, these are just terms for you to to have in your hand, so that when you are talking to your peers in IT department, you have some ideas of what this may be. But again, we should not have to understand these at all to deliver high quality, secure networks uh, and systems in the building technology space. Our application layer um, provides um, just is the application or so, as you think, imagine if you're using an app as you have in your phone or so, this is just what you're experiencing or what you're using yourself. Now there are a couple of layers of the OSI that are kind of encapsulated into this as we look at the application layer or so. Um, but yeah, many high level protocols, um, it's, uh, if at all possible, you should take to, uh, yeah, to try down, try to learn the different types of ones. Um, so we've, as you said, mentioned there, HTTP, uh, HTTP through HTTPS. Um, we do have um, NTP, so that's just the ways that we sync up our, our sync up our system so that everyone's on the same clock. Um, then we have how domain name lookup or um, domain name systems there, DNS, if you put in a word and you want to look it up. So just many different ways of going from kind of the real world or our world, what we're what's in our head and what the time is around us and figuring out how we're going to have ways of these devices that are um, establishing that are going across because obviously we can't be learning off IP addresses of everything and we can't just be um, syncing everything up perfectly. So there's these ways of having the devices being able to establish these connections, being able to um, you know, being, being able to agree how they're going to how they're going to go about or what time they're going to look at, what time they're using to reference, what time to look up and all the settings that you would need. Yeah, and so in this application layer, uh, for, again, for networking, now we're, we we're talking about BACnet, but we're talking about the high level of BACnet. We're talking about Modbus at the high level, not the zeros and ones. We're now talking about how to uh, how security systems work. They have a protocol called Onviv, right? So again, it's leveraging everything we've been talking about for the last three weeks, all the different layers underneath it, breaking it down into the different layers and networking. We'll, we'll come to that, uh, but in this, category here it's everything that we use uh from https to snmp to backnet so let's keep going oops sorry too fast uh, it, perfect so on uh, the application layer if you imagine as well we're saying we have our layers as it structures down when you have your application layer at the top that's you using your your device your phone your, your app and then you'll be going down obviously through the layers as you get to the signal that's going to be ones and zeros being sent across your line so in your application layer, you can have two ways that you're trying to connect with someone. Either it can be going from your device down through the layers and going to a server, 
and then coming back or else it can be going down through your device and back to another device so there's two ways we can do this um, for just general communication is trying to access something such as a server such as you know your websites and um, your stored information and then there's trying to contact someone or some someone uh, maybe if you're vpning to a device even or so but diff different ways of having communication between your devices and servers so um so with a client server it is centralized more um, obviously you are contacting one thing that could be easier to monitor kind of request who's accessing it this is the one area we can put our passcodes on it very stable um, but however there's only that one server so if you have everyone trying to use it at one time that can be more cause a bit of congestion a bit of a bottleneck um, whereas with peer-to-peer -peer, you can have many different people talk to each other as long as they're not all trying to talk to the same one person it's not going to cause a bottleneck it's going to be cheaper because you don't happen to set up a server but then the only problem with this is if I send something to somebody, they can send it to someone else and it could be harder to track who's getting information or who, how they're going when you use your peer-to-peer. -peer. So it can be easier to um, have centralized communication, but obviously this is going to be more costly and you would need to invest more in order to get a seamless system or one that can handle the amount of uh, requests you might be dealing with. This is where we start hearing a lot of the term of the edge computing, right? Uh, so as our edge devices become more powerful, we can leverage peer-to-peer -peer type of communication more with more power. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, these are different considerations. Oh okay, yeah, let's talk about BACnet. Um, again, I know a large majority of people who are here uh, use BACnet on a daily basis. Uh, so now again, looking at all the layers we've talked about, let's break it down. So in BACnet, we're talking about um, our RS-485 being that that lower, lower level, and then it goes to Ethernet, that's your da data layer, um, sorry, access layer, and then on the blue here, your network layer will be over IP, uh, and in between there, it will go to UDP, and then it goes to BACnet. Right, so we took a, here a snapshot of what you would see if you to, you were to sniff a complete back packet on the network. You would see the network layer, sorry, the Ethernet layer, the IP layer, the UDP layer, and on top of that, your backnet layer. So this is again coming back to that example of sending a packet, a parcel, or a letter. The payload from a networking standpoint is your backnet message, right? It has your network ID, it has your device ID, it has you know what type of message is it? Is it, in this case an IM? What object are you? Um, the device ID, and you're putting that into an envelope, which is called the UDP envelope, so the transport layer. Then it puts it in an, another envelope that's called the IP layer. IPv4 in this case, then the last layer is your Ethernet layer, and you're sending that over Ethernet, over fiber, over wireless. So you can see how these layers are stacked up together. Profinet, long talk. I mean, these we're not going to go into detail, but it's the same idea, right? So the Profinet message gets wrapped into different layers, and then that final layer is typically Ethernet or MSTP, something that the machines can understand and it sends it over the line that connects the different machines and then it, 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 it decapsulates them again. It, it removes the layers, the, uh, the envelopes, and then presents it to the application and going to the application layer again. Uh, Tom, you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, well, just different types of applications or things that we may be using, um, different ways to uh, see them or use them. So an example now we have is a motion JPEG or movie J motion JPEG, I believe. Um, so that's are just the same as your JPEG images, and we use that over HTTP. So that can be, often the way this works is you might try to access, you'll go to access a camera. So if you're sitting at your desk as a security guard, you say, I wanna see how it looks around the side here, um, where this blue car is, we're gonna go click on camera number, camera number four or so, and then what we're go that's gonna do is that's gonna send a request, a get request to um, for this stream or to access the stream of data that has been taken live or so. So we'll access this, what it actually is gonna do is HTTP, it's going to um, set, send these as a sequence, actually just a sequence of JPEGs. So just a load of, as it breaks down, it is just solid images being put back to back to back to make it look like a mo motion picture. Um, each image is separated. Um, it, there's not uh, little sections of video or so, but each image is separated and it's create, uh, we create a sequence of these images and we just put them in a packet together. 
that's going to keep getting sent out over the HTTP until uh, to our to our screen to our end device to our user on as long as he wants. So we may have a 20 minute cutoff. Some that may be something with the server from the moment the request is made. We may have some settings like this, or you may have constant stream until he decides to just as we as we often do, click the red button in the top right hand corner. So just different different protocols, different ways. Each thing that is different, uh, or each um, different protocol, each different application you use often can have slightly different things, but they're all it's all the same reasoning or the same discussion being had often as how we're going to get the information from point A to point B. So one of the big reason why we put MJPEG here as an example is that when we look at Modbus, Profinet, uh, uh, Backnet, Lawn, it doesn't really matter. In in many cases a single packet on a network represents a single message. It's not always the case, um, So, uh, but those control protocol often map from one message to one packet. But when you look at MJPEG over HTTP, it's not one packet being one frame. It, it gets broken down into many, many, many frames. A frame can contain uh, a portion of a frame, sorry, a, a, a packet can contain a portion of an image or it can contain more than one image. Um, so this is where the network stack comes in and it does that work. The application doesn't have to break it up. It sends it to the operating system of the machine. The machine would then break it up and go through all the different layers or package it into different size that it, it that is most optimal and then send it over the line and in this case if it's using http it will be over tcp it would have built in um uh, hand, uh, error handling and and uh, acknowledgement so it can adapt to that without the application having to do all the heavy work um yeah, so then we go on to encryption so obviously encryption is quite quite a major part of everything nowadays because encryption and security they do quite go hand in hand when we're trying to send information across so obviously the security accessing your data and then we want to make sure we send our data that this data is safe while being sent and that is done through encryption so encryption at the network layer that is often just um it's a use the key as we were saying with our https so what we're going to do is we're going to get a blender we're going to use an equation that takes the specific key and uses it to hash up and um, blend up everything into a completely unusable set of random codes what we want to know when we get to the far side is that's going to be used and the same key in certain cases you now symmetrical and asymmetrical we look at there if it's the same key or if it's a different key that's used to unload uh, on um, or to decrypt our, our code that's uh two different two different types of systems we have what's interesting now is we also have uh oh yeah perfect sorry I'll, I'll go to, um so we are symmetric there and asymmetric so there are two types of um uh, two types of encryption we can have. So obviously one is where we have a pre-established key that both users know. So it's going to be the same for being for encrypting and decrypting. And then asymmetric, that extra bit of um, that extra bit of security there where maybe we will have, might have a secret key that only the person who's receiving it knows. And then we might have a public key for encrypting it. So it just means that anyone can encrypt this information, but once it is encrypted, it can become more difficult to decrypt or it's less likely that the key will be shared around for some, some situations like this. So just two different, different means of having um, the same, the same effect of encrypting and decrypting. This is all on our network layer now as well um, for this type of encryption. We do also, or... Yeah. So I was going to say, so the reason why we're adding this in is that this is an important concept now. Cybersecurity is a very, very big deal. Uh, the symmetric encryption is, is more of an academic um, exercise. I don't think it's really used in, in uh, practical use case, um, asymmetric encryption, if anyone learned uh, matrices, you're using the same key to encrypt it than to decrypt it. Um, and the problem there is that unless you're pre-sharing that key, so I walk to Thomas's house and I tell him what that code is, uh, if you're transmitting over the wire, you're, you're ris risking that someone in the middle, a man in the middle can, can, can um, intercept that key original at the beginning when things are not encrypted. So uh, symmetric keys are really only used if they are shared um, out of band, outside of the network. Uh, anything that's networking based is, is asymmetric encryption, often called a public-private uh, encryption. And so that one is a lot more powerful in terms of security. Say, uh, everything we do, HTTPS, uh, anything else, it all uses this type of encryption where it uses a certain key to encrypt it, uh, but to decrypt it, it uses a different key. And so uh, just...
networks is because most of us are starting to move into APIs, we're talking about BACnet SC, um, that that public key is transmitted over the wire. So even if someone in the middle at, at, was able to intercept the key, all it means is that they would be able to encrypt messages, but they wouldn't be able to decrypt messages. So um, sender A sends it to B, um, here's my public key. B will use that public key to encrypt it, which therefore means even B could not decrypt its own packet that it encrypted, send it over the wire, and then only A that, that holds that secret key, that private key, will be able to decrypt it. So and that's the, the, the way most of what we do now works, um, and that's how HTTPS works. So this is all um, this is all network layer. So this is all our, our network stuff as well. So there is actually with BACnet. Um, if, we, if we jump back to the last slide there as well, we're able to see that with BACnet, there actually is a um, you have kind of application layer encryption. So you can actually they can encrypt on the application layer itself before we go down through these layers. So this actually means that this code, the the encryption has occurred before we get to a lot of these network layers, and even for uploading onto things like cloud or for sending. Or before it even goes into the Splendor, it is already an encrypted, um, encrypted packet or so. So it's just an extra layer of security before it's even going through these processes. It's encrypted. So if anyone has a means of possibly getting it beforehand or having access to it, Lord knows how. But um, it'd be it, this information is actually getting encrypted almost in the initial layer, one of the first um, as soon as it's created or so. Um, we also have then finally I think Backnet over uh, Backnet over SC or Backnet SC. So backnet secure connection. So this is a this is encrypted data link layer. So this is what this is is, is um we're going to secure increase just um, have an increased level or, or make sure everything that's being sent on the uh, the backnet system itself is going to be encrypted as well. So that we're not sending it through IP infrastructure or if we do have ourselves on a, on um, another system or an older uh, an IT system that we're not letting our information be easier accessed or it's not. Um, causing any damage that you can get through something. So it is also important to note that with this BACnet SC, one of the reasons this has become so, uh, there's been such demand for this, this sort of thing, or it's so important, because a lot of people, while BACnet is becoming and growing and going, uh, becoming a lot more, people are realizing a lot more how important it is. We're also realizing that some places don't have the availability to create a new network for BACnet. It's always the ideal and always the recommended to keep them separate as possible. But now with sort of the need for some people to use existing infrastructure or to um, piggyback some of the IT infrastructure, um, back that or with security being secure just becomes much more important than it ever has been. I not only did send a link out to everyone, uh, we did do a short presentation on BACnet SC with uh, some people in the industry. So uh, if you're interested, check it out. We're not going to dive into BACnet SC here. It's, we don't have the time for it. If you do have any questions, uh, send them over. It, it is uh, a protocol that we are watching very carefully, a standard, I should say, we're watching very carefully. It's going to be exciting for this industry, but uh, it's going to take some work for everyone to, to get that in. Uh, with that said, uh, our next session is next Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. We'll talk about primarily the difference between managed and unmanaged switches, mm -hmm. understand why some switches are $15 and some of them are $1,500 uh, when a packet can still be sent from port one to port two uh, on both the, both type of switches. So we'll, we'll explore that. Um, Thomas, anything else to add? No, perfect. Um, thanks very much, Chris. We'll... Yeah, thank you very much. Stay safe, have a great weekend. Uh, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.